Shi Baba O O Shi Baba 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 Shi Baba O Welcome, my name is Aita Sadu and welcome to Soil to Soul 360. And I am very happy at the hour of 9.30 p.m. <laughs> to welcome Leah Penniman to a different book list cultural center, The People's Residence. Mm. And Leah, we are really excited that you are here in our city and we are excited that you are here to speak to Farming While Black. <laughs> But I gotta say, Leah, it's 9.30 p.m. and you're a farmer. Is this kind of late for you? <laughs> well, I do have this sparkly exterior <laughs> glow right now. But yes, this is very late. Uh, I got up early this morning. We, we drove um, my soul sister and I from the Albany, New York area about seven Ooh, hours. And then okay. we just had the privilege of being at Food Share for a Black Caucus conversation and then came over here because I was told that it is not possible to come to Toronto without spending time here at this historic community space and book space. And so I'm very, very grateful to be here with you. Well, I'm happy that you are here because in this place and in the bookstore called A Different Book List, we've had the good fortune to know and to host a woman by the name of Rita Springer, mm -hmm. who wrote the Caribbean cookbook. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that that is one of the first cookbooks that was published in the English speaking Caribbean. And she came from Barbados. Mm. And not only did we carry that work, but at one point in time, we had the opportunity to meet her. And today, while I was holding your book and getting ready for this big moment, um, I thought about the likes of Rita Springer. I thought about another woman by the name of Carmita Fraser. Mm -hmm. And I really want to big her up because I noted in your book that your book for me um, is a little bit like Sankofa, where you look at the past to be informed about the future. Mm -hmm. And so hence, I'm speaking about these ancestors. But what Carmita did for the region of the Caribbean and for Barbados in particular, she made us look at our local foods. Yeah. And not only did she talk about how we could prepare them, but she also talked about the people who brought that food to our tables. So I wanted to shout her out. I wanted to shout out another woman by the name of Enid Donaldson and she brought us the taste of Jamaica. And for a moment there in time, people would come into the shop and they would say, you have Ina Donaldson book, because it just wasn't about the recipes. It was also too about the language and how it was written and, and, and the storytelling that was implicit in it. Um, so I had those thoughts. I even thought about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad there mm -hmm. for a moment. And for a moment, his book was the reference of how to eat, how mm -hmm. to live, and you know, that was a whole passion. But coming back to Farming While Black, and um, I, I'm curious about the title. I'm curious that you started the book with Brother Malcolm X um, and his reference to the ownership of land, and even talking about Black Land Matters. So in terms of language, it sounds like Come on, movement, we are ready to amp up. <laughs> so tell me about that choice of language mm. and what led you to that title. So as listeners might understand, right, Farming Well Black has several meanings. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're all familiar with how dangerous it is right now in our society to be black, to drive while black, to walk while black, to play with a toy gun as a young person while black. Those things can get you killed. Mm -hmm. um, so Farming Well Black, has been something that's been very dangerous for black people here uh, in Turtle Island on this continent. We were stolen for our agricultural genius, 12 and a half million of us, and forced to do unpaid labor in the southern part of the United States, throughout the Caribbean, throughout South and Central America, and so forth, building trillions of dollars of wealth. 
Then there was sharecropping, tenant farming, convict leasing. And when we tried to do independent farming and own our own land, the backlash was severe. Quite literally, white supremacists would burn down homes of people mm -hmm. who had the audacity to try to farm independently, lynch people. 4,500 people were lynched, drove a whole exodus of black folks from the southern part of the United States. So farming while black has been a dangerous thing to do. And at the same time, the four or 500 years of land-based oppression is far outshined by the 10,000 years of noble, beautiful, dignified connection to agrarianism and to land. So this book both exposes the harm, but also <laughs> calls us back to a truer and longer story of what our natural right, and, and ancestral connection to the earth is. Mm -hmm. I also noted in the book that you referenced even Harriet Tubman yeah. and you positioned her as a herbalist and, and a woman of medicine and that's very historic. And um, we come from a time where that connection with land was spiritual, it was sacred. And then somewhere along the line, it almost seemed as though someone told us that agriculture and our relationship to the mm -hmm. land was slavery. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to comment on that. I want you to comment maybe the pre-emancipation period and that post, and you alluded to that a little bit. But we struggle oftentimes, even with our young people, to have them have an association and a relationship with land. We do, absolutely. And now science has caught up to what we've already known, that trauma is inherited. It actually impacts your epigenetics, so your gene expression. Uh, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors carry trauma. Great-grandchildren of enslaved Africans carry trauma. And we see this, you know, when we're out on the farm, a van load of black youth roll up, and they're like, oh, no, miss, I am not getting out of this van. There's bears, there's <laughs> bugs, there's dirt, no way. And if I stoop, what they're really saying, right, it's not I'm afraid of bugs, but if I stoop, if I sweat, if I get dirty, that's going to make me a slave. That's going to mm. revert me to bondage. Because as Chris Bolden Newsom, who's a black farmer in Philadelphia, would say, the land was the scene of the crime. Mm. But she was not the criminal. And so when we mix up the oppression that took place on the land with the land herself and name her the oppressor and run as far as we can from the red clays of Georgia to the paved streets of Toronto or Pittsburgh or wherever we're going to go, we also leave behind a big part of our culture, our spirituality, our connection to our ancestors, our source of wisdom. Because it is bare feet on the earth that allow us to hear the whispers of our ancestors about how we are to behave and the truth that we belong. And so I think that, you know, as you know, there's a big component of healing that needs to go along with it. And what I try to do in the book in lifting up Harriet Tubman and other ancestors is to help us understand that there's a different narrative than just slavery. You know, you can go back all the way to Cleopatra. She was doing vermicomposting. That's worm composting. It's something that you think white hippies do today. But Cleopatra literally would put you to death if you hurt a worm. And she had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time study was dedicated to the habits of earthworms because she knew that their castings were what would feed her empire. Mm. And USDA scientists, government scientists, went in the 1940s to measure the worm castings down in the soil from that era. And they were 40 times more than anywhere in the United States because mm -hmm. she was literally composting, right? So those kind of stories and many, many more were very important for me in my own healing that I just wasn't nuts, you know, to want to farm, that I was actually building on a positive legacy of my ancestors, you know, going back thousands of years. Well, I'm beginning to look at worms a whole lot different now, and, you know, <laughs> next time I'm not going to be screamish and think, no, you're actually royalty stuff. Exactly. You, you know, I mean, I think she has good. other people touch them, but <laughs> she was definitely about the yeah. worms. <laughs> Prior to our interview, two young bloods came to uh, the space, mm -hmm. uh, to a different book list, and uh, we told them that you were coming and you were coming with this book, Farming Wild Black. And one uh, of the brothers, Alistair in particular, and he's writing a book right now. He was actually next mm. door and he was, he's working on a manuscript. And uh, he picked up your book and he goes, oh man, this is the heaviest book I ever picked up, right? And I said to him, but you're smiling. Now that's a good thing mm -hmm. because it wasn't a book 
from just him skimming it that is of oppression, but somehow it also made him smile. Mm. So in a way it told me that what he saw was liberating at the same time. So we had a little giggle about that prior to you coming. Tell me a little bit about your background, and I'm sure that people who are listening here in Canadaville and the great city of Toronto um, want to know a little bit about you. I'm told that you grew up in the rural north, and when they said rural north, it's like, okay, north, like that seemed to be a Canadian term, you know, north, <laughs> like that, that's us. Uh, yeah, so give me a little bit no, of No, it's true. Yes. I never thought of myself as south <laughs> until this moment, but yes. <laughs> so... Um, Let's see, I grew up in Ashburnham, Massachusetts, which is a very small town, rural town. Most of the time living with my white father. Um, I lived with my black mother when she was well enough to have us, and she was in the Boston area. So I had this really bicultural experience and became bilingual in cultures and learned how to code switch and move between worlds uh, with grace. But it was really rough. We were the only brown kids in our school. And so you can imagine a conservative town like we lived, what the social situation was like. A lot of bullying, harassment, even outright violence no. against my siblings and I. <laughs> it was rough. But what happened out of that was this intense and ferocious love of nature. Mm. Because the earth was kind to us. The earth was healing to mm. us. So we spent all our time in the woods. My sister, oh my goodness, bless her heart, she was always more brave than me. When loggers would come, to take down the trees in the forest, little six-year-old Naima would literally go up and put her body in the way and say, you're not gonna cut down my friend, right? Mm. It was a ferocious love. And so as I got older and was looking about jobs and career, you know, in um, high school needed to get a job, I picked up a flyer for a farm job because I thought that's a way to serve the earth, mm. my friend, mm. and completely fell in love with the elegant simplicity of the, like, you plant a seed, you pull food out, you give it to people and they're well. No one could tell me that's bad. No one could tell me that's a waste of time. It's elegant, it's neat. It's what my confused adolescent brain needs to feel like a good person. And I just never stopped. That was 1996 when I started farming. Mm -hmm. Worked at a lot of farms, urban, rural, and eventually started Soul Fire, predominantly because my family, I was then partnered, partner Jonah. We had our two children who are now teenagers were very small. And even with my college education, even knowing how to farm, I moved into the south end of Albany, which is what Karen Washington would call a food apartheid neighborhood. It's a zip code that's been redlined, it's been discriminated against, no grocery stores, no you know, farmer's markets, no community gardens, nothing. I could not get fresh food for my children. Mm. I couldn't, and I was very motivated to do it. I ended up having to buy a share from a farm, walk over two miles to pick it up, back down the hill, piling heavy vegetables on the lap of my very sweet and loving two-year-old who did not complain, right? That was how to get the food. So when our neighbors found out that we knew how to farm, they're like, what are you waiting for? You know, start the farm for us, start the farm for the people. And Soul Fire was born out of that clamor of our neighbors to have fresh food doorstep delivery um, to address the, the food issues in that community. Well, they say that necessity is the mother yes. of invention. One of the things, too, that I'm noting all the time in, in your language, uh, you talk about grace. I mean, a language that you don't normally associate with food, and you talk about elegance, and, and, and it, it shows a different perspective, too, mm -hmm. that, that you're bringing to this conversation around food. Another thing, too, that we are curious about, and you discuss your work with the Boston Food Project. Yeah. A um, lot of excitement around that. Um, you talked about when you encountered the project, how unique it was bringing this social ethic and this social justice conversation or language together. One thing I would say, the first time I heard the term food security, I hated it. Mm. I, I couldn't figure out how the word security was in the same sentence with food. It seemed like this was a, it was an oxymoron. This was a pleasurable thing and like, oh my God, I had military uh, all at the same time going on. So I'm also intrigued in the coming together of this social uh, justice uh, project and, 
and uh, some of the other things involved in the, the Boston experience. So again, if this is something that is best practice here in Canada, we want to know about it and we want more people to, to read that book and, and to get the book, right? Uh, but talk to us a little bit about that too. Sure. Yeah. So that first farming job I got at age 16 yeah. was at the Food Project, okay. which has grown a lot, but at the time it was really small. We reclaimed urban vacant lots you know, in Boston as well as did this rural farm. And the food we grew, we ran a farmer's market in the city, uh, low-income farmer's market as well as soup kitchen type stuff. Not radical, pretty reformist. But what was really important for me about it was being with other black and brown young people who were doing something for our community and were seen as having a future. You know, we, we weren't, uh, so much society gives us the message, you're either going to be incarcerated, right, you're going to get mm -hmm. killed early, you are going to just be a consumer, you're going to be plugged into the machine, but there was a sense of some other possibility there, and that, that was very important for me. I ended up starting with my husband a, a project that replicated the food project called Youth Grow in Worcester, Massachusetts, which is still going, and some of the teens that we worked with back in the early 2000s are now leading the program. Is that that each one teach one concept? Each one teach one. And okay. I think that's very, very crucial because while I'm now a rural farmer, urban farming is often the first touch for the returning generation. We are the grandchildren of the great migration of black people leaving the red clays of Georgia, right? Leaving behind. And the way to come home to the earth is to touch her. Because she's been calling you, and as soon as you have that contact, there's just no turning back, you know. But to give urban youth in particular paid opportunities to do good work in their community, right, I think is a very crucial puzzle piece in the whole picture of healing this very oppressive food system that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to plug to the the folks at the African Food Basket yes. and um, Zola, Anan, also too for their consistency and, yeah. and their commitment to in the city of bringing more awareness around food to us. Um, at one point in time, we were so excited when uh, the food boxes came to our homes, and you know we had access to that. Um, so that's a wonderful thing. In in the book, also too, there is a chapter about youth, to youth. And I want to know too, when people write, and um, somewhere in the book, you wrote this book, this work, because of your passion at an amazing period of time. It was how many months it took you to put this thing together. I thought that was like really I wrote remarkable. the book in 40 days. In 40 days, yeah. that, that, that is awesome. Um, and also too, I noticed that you gave a lot of props too to the research team. Mm -hmm. But in the particular chapter, on youth is that is that the audience or are we as you know I'm, I'm a youth myself I, 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 are we as senior people <laughs> is, is it an instruction of how we can engage youth when you wrote that what what was your thinking around that oh that's a great question so the book has a few audiences mm -hmm. the central audience is this returning generation of black farmers it's people who realize and leaving the land behind as a people, we left that little piece of our souls behind. Mm -hmm. And it's super practical. Like, I'm one of those folks that does not have a lot of patience for Twitter activism, don't have a lot of patience for theory. I'm like, do you have chicken poop on your boots? Then we can talk, you mm -hmm. know? And so it's, it's literally, how do you find lands? Yeah, I have, <laughs> I don't have chicken poop, but I definitely at least yes. have some dirt, right? Yeah. So, you know, how do you find land? How do you put down the seed? How do you build a curriculum? How do you deal with eroded, uh, eroded and degraded or toxic land? All of these things are laid out. So it's for us, primarily. But black folks didn't mess up the food system, right? And so we can't alone, nor should we, have to heal it and, and make it just. And so the book is also by extension for everyone in society. There's a whole chapter just for white people. There's a whole chapter on the history of racism in the food system that's really designed to, to motivate and inspire the community to take action. Because right now, farm workers don't get a fair shake at all in our societies. You know, underpaid, don't have the same labor laws, no uh, right to unionize, et cetera. We have an issue where in the United States, 98% of the rural land is owned by white people, which is a greater racial disparity than ever in history. Mm dispossession of native folks, dispossession of black and brown folks. We have the food apartheid issue where, you know, if you're black or brown, you're more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and go hungry. 
you know, and not to mention the trauma that we inherit, not to mention the negative impact on the earth herself and the environment and the climate. So these are, these are all of our issues. And so my goal with the book was to certainly give tools to black farmers, but also to kind of kick us all in the pants that we got to deal with these food issues as a community. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that made me really happy in the book was also to your reference to Cuba. And at one point in our history as a bookstore back then, we had a book, we received this book on, I think there were like, not the Cuban five, no, but they were like three men uh, who were Cubans and who had done a lot of work in Havana um, with urban yeah. um, planting and, and farming. And I, and so we got really excited. We are big supporters of, 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 of Cuba and uh, have a lot of respect uh, for what the country has accomplished. So here it was that uh, they had taken this urban farming to places like Europe and around the world. And I think when we received it in Toronto, it was like, oh my gosh, the best thing since sliced bread. So I was particularly um, happy to see that there was the reference to Cuba. Having said that, what I'm interested now in is what are the international networks and relationships mm -hmm. within the diaspora, if you will, um, that you work with or you relate with or your organization is involved with? Absolutely. Yeah, so the thing is that the folks who are closest to the land are the ones who have the solutions to our food and ag issues. Mm -hmm. And that's the peasant farmers of the world, the paysan, the campesinos. And so I've been, we've been really, really blessed to be welcomed into friendship by farmers in a number of communities. In Haiti, which is my maternal mm -hmm. homeland, mm -hmm. uh, in Ghana, which is a little bit further back, my maternal homeland, as well as Brazil, Vieques, Puerto Rico, and Mexico. And we go in a spirit of friendship and intercambio. Uh, we're not trying to be international extension agents to tell folks what they need to do on their land. No. We're not trying to do that, <laughs> yeah. but unfortunately that happens a lot. <laughs> but what we're doing is bringing our labor, our love, and material resource. We do a lot of fundraising for our sibling farms and s go on a delegation once or twice a year in the winter when things slow down on our farm to help out in the way that's needed. Mm. So, for example, in Haiti, after the big hurricane a couple of years back, all the crops were wiped out. People mm. rely on their crops. So there would be famine if they couldn't get a second pro crop, but it was the dry season. So irrigation became necessary. All they needed was a pump, and then the rest was communal labor. Mm. So we fundraised. It was like a few hundred dollars. You know, we fundraised for this pump. Someone got on their motorbike, you know, went to Port au Prince, got the pump, was back in a couple of hours, and people were already done digging all of these basins and channels, which, by the way, were the first irrigation systems from East Africa, and irrigated 26 farms, you know, by the end of the day. Um, and so it, it's been very, very important to follow the lead of what they say they need, regardless of whether we... Um, agree or understand with those mm -hmm. goals. So. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, uh, um, one, another thing, too, that I picked up in the book, and, and this is new for me, uh, conferences where black farmers and people of African descent get together, and also, too, in North America, because um, I, my childhood is based in the Caribbean. I grew up in Barbados, so when I think of land and land connection, it is in the Caribbean. When I think of North America, I think more of a connection to the concrete. Mm. So it, it's, a, it's a, um, a, a different understanding. So when I read about the conferences and I'm thinking, is it because that I'm not in the food sector that I'm not aware of farmers and black farmers? Because again, the, 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 this whole issue of food seemed to be oftentimes not our issue. Um, I have a joke, and I think we were talking a little bit about it earlier, where when we talk about the environment and we talk about certain issues around food, it's not our conversation. It's, of, it's oftentimes like a downtown conversation. Like, I feel like I need to be walking with my bottle of water and walking two dogs and, you know, all that kind of stuff to have this conversation. So uh, 
give us to a sense of what's happening, that dynamic of discussion and debate, and, and maybe people here, we want to cross the border. Do we want to cross? Yes, we, we want to cross the border to be included in, in those types you of conversations. You don't have two dogs <laughs> <and> a water <laughs> bottle? Uh, you know what? I'm working on that. I'm, I'm trying to work on my <laughs> yoga outfit right now, but I can't find the right one to really make me pop, so hence I, I haven't done that yet. <laughs> and you know, my bad. I'm sure I've just lost all my yoga friends, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. Okay, so the idea that food is a white people issue is definitely not a new idea. So Fannie Lou Hamer, who is a much mm. revered political activist in our circles, uh, founder of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, gave a famous speech in front of our Congress about, you know, life as a sharecropper. But she's really known for that political work. So she would gather together all of the youngins, you know, who wanted to organize with her into her home. And they would look up, and on all her walls, she had pickled you know, watermelon rind and, and pickle eggs and collard greens and gumbo soup, all these things. And they're like, Mama Hamer, what are you doing? She said, child, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to do, mm. right? And if you don't have anything on your shelf, as soon as they padlock that supermarket, you'll forget about all your civil rights, voter rights, all of these campaigns for, you know, because you're hungry. <laughs> so we need to be in charge of our basic survival, our basic means of production in order to resist. It's a prerequisite for true resistance because otherwise you're completely de dependent on a system that hates you and doesn't have your best interests, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the legacy we're really building on. But you're right, it has been uh, a quieter voice in the black community of late and to the point where as an older teen, I almost quit farming <laughs> because my black friends were like, can you help us with the education issues? Can you help us with the gun violence? Can you help us with the housing discrimination? Any of these real issues? Like, why are you playing in the dirt? We need your intelligence on this side. You know, and I, I almost stopped. And it was a black elder, Karen Washington of Rise and Root Farm mm -hmm. and the Black uh, Farmers Conference, who I met at one of these almost all white spaces. And she said, you know, Liam, one day we will have a conference and one day we'll have a book. We don't yet, but we will. And true to her word, she started the conference, 2010, the National Black Farmers Conference. It's lit, it's like 500 people getting together. It moves between different regions in the right. U.S. Maybe we can get it to come to Canada next year. Right. And, um, and I wrote one of the books, as did Dr. Monica White. You know, there's a couple of folks, Tasha Bowens, who've come out with books, um, Dr. Ashanti Reese. But all of the books before my generation were requiems for the black farmer. They were like, how are we dying? Hmm. But this is about how we contributed, how are we thriving, right? which was really important. Well, I told you that the young blood, he said it was a heavy book, but when he <laughs> picked it up, he picked it up with joy. So, so this is a good thing. Um, they wouldn't I, let me put any more pages, I tried. <laughs> I was like, I'm not done it. Huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> but at the same time, um, in looking at the book, and I, I'm looking at the book now through the eyes of a retailer and, and, mm -hmm. and, and a bookseller, and, you know, oftentimes people want, give me the book on, um, this book must have in everything you want to know about air, <laughs> all right? Um, but to say to people, you can enter into the discussion and enter into the movement, I prefer to say that, and enter yeah. into the movement um, with a book that is practical. Um, it gives you a little bit of everything, the, the types of plants, its implication with herbs. There's even a business plan. Um, the legal terms, you know, so, um, and, and I'm thinking of high school students and, and people like that too, if they were doing a project uh, to get them engaged, where in this gospel here, um, we can find a lot of information, but then we can also reference. Having said that too, what are some of the challenges and what has been your biggest challenge that you found in, in this journey of life, Farmin? Well, oh, my whole journey of life. It's a constant challenge. Let's see. At the beginning, the biggest challenge was my youthful naivete. Mm -hmm. I was just ready to change the world, <laughs> and I assumed it would be not so hard. So I'll tell you a quick story. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of money. We had saved money. We thought we had a lot of money because we had saved. I was a public school teacher. We were living our whole family in a one-room anarchist collective situation that was <laughs> nasty. Anyway, we saved plenty. We bought our land outright, like cash yeah. notes, you know. But then we didn't have any money, and we didn't realize that then you need to put a driveway, a septic, a well, build a house, no. you know, all the other things <laughs> that come. So 
So we're literally digging out our foundation with shovels because we didn't have money to hire an excavator. And we want to build a solar house, you know, so it's got to face south. We dug for months through our hard clay rocks. And there's one day where Jonah goes to me, you know, is magnetic south the same as solar south? I said, what are you talking about? He's like, I just have this vague thing from earth science. Like there's some, so I look it up. We didn't even have internet. I had to like go look it up at the library. So yes, it is. It's 13 degrees off where we live, which means that we had dug the foundation 13 degrees in the wrong direction for a solar house. And we would need to adjust <laughs> over the next 30 to 60 days. <laughs> so we're in this hole covered in mud. I'm literally bleeding out my hands from all the shoveling. And my husband looks at me like, well, do you want to quit? And I'm crying. I'm like, never. <laughs> He's like, do you want to quit? He's like, never. <laughs> so it was a lot of that in the early years of just like, thank God we're in our 20s. But more recently, I think the challenges have honestly been, how do we all work together? Mm. Monsanto's not our biggest enemy. Mm. It's within our own communities. You know, now I've had the privilege to travel to a lot of grassroots, like dope, beautiful organizations, I won't name any names, all around the land. And everyone is struggling with how do we transform conflict? How do we see each other, maybe between the black and indigenous community with the harms that have been caused and really listen and be humble and take accountability, right? How do we compromise? How do we release our ego? And it has been, for our movement to succeed, we're gonna have to figure out the relational piece of that deeper trust and collaboration. Mm -hmm. so. um, you talked about Zora Neale Hurston, and Zora Neale Hurston is one of my favorite people, Zora Neale Hurston, the anthropologist and the storyteller. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, as she traveled uh, the South for America and she went to the Caribbean, um, one of my favorite moments with her is when she visited Jamaica and uh, experience the wakes and the mm. weddings and all those early celebrations, the birthing of people. But in the book, in Farming Wild Black, you talked about when she would encounter people and she wanted to know the songs and she wanted to know the sayings and she would listen and then she would get involved mm -hmm. and then she would repeat it back. It was almost like call and response. And people say, yeah, girl, you know, you, yeah, you sound good. You got the right words, right? What are the songs and the stories in this journey that you like to share with young people or those songs of food? When you're thinking of food, what do you sing? What is that story that you tell, that you giggle? Um, mosquito one, mosquito two, who stole the cookie from the cookie jar? I don't know. Yes. What is it? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I'll spare you any of my singing, but I will tell you that the reason we sing so much on, on our farm is because some of my teachers in Ghana, the Queen Mothers, once asked me, incredulously, is it true that in the United States a farmer will put a seed in the grounds, they will not pray or sing or pour libation or dance or even say thank you to the earth and expect the seed to grow? Yes. They said, that's why you're all sick. You're all sick because you treat the earth like a commodity from which you can extract and not like the living, breathing Orisha, mother of life, home of the ancestors that she is, deserving of respect and reciprocity. So they were like, don't tell me that you're going to go back to the States and put some seeds in without singing. Like, here's your song. <laughs> so I sing a lot of traditional songs. But with the youth, um, there's one, there's actually a traditional Ghanaian game where you pass a rock around a circle to a rhythm, and you sing a song about going to Kumasi with your friends. Oh, sa mi na mi na mi na mi na. Oh, sa. It's too hard sometimes for youth to catch. So we have them put their own chants but we still pass the rock. They try to cut us down, but we're gonna be all right. They try to cut us down, but we're gonna be all right. So we do a lot of that rhythm, movement, game, you know, and then if they mess up the rock passing, they laugh, they try again, you know. Very cool, very cool. Uh, the, the, seeing that in the book mm -hmm. um, made that for me very well-rounded mm -hmm. and and any time that we expressed ourselves and our cultural expression, food is always involved. Mm -hmm. So again, I was particularly pleased uh, to see you also had that playfulness mm. uh, in the book, um, as well as all of those things that we need to know ab mm -hmm. about food. And your intersection, though, with people who are, like, let's say, in the 
who are naturopaths or alternative medicine, as we call it in North America, like what's alternative to what? Um, what's your relationship or the, your organization's relationship with them? Are yeah. there allies? Like, how do you intersect with some of these people? Yeah, I mean, we're, we are them. <laughs> In many ways, you know, I'm not a certified clinician or anything, but we do grow a lot of sacred and healing herbs. We make medicines. We distribute medicines through our farm share. So we do a doorstep delivery program of foods. And there was this one beautiful moment, uh, always in the tour, the youth are very interested in the medicine garden. We do a Haitian style, Jardin La Cou. So this one little boy, Librado, young teen, uh, was telling me that he has trouble sleeping at night. He has nightmares. Hmm. And so I picked him some different things, some chamomile, some lemon balm, some skull cap, put in a little satchel. I said, make yourself some tea before you sleep. We'll bring you tender dreams. And he clutched this parcel like magic. Like you can pick a plant and it helps you. Like you don't have to go to the hospital, the pharmacy. You mm. don't have to be sick. You can just grow it. That sense of empowerment that we can have our own medicines is really, really important. Um, and we do have a couple of explicit healing trainings. So we do a couple of workshops around herbalism, and we have a whole weekend of a Black Herbalist Healers Weekend on the farm uh, called Harriet's Apothecary in the legacy of Harriet Tubman, which is a, a really powerful space as well. What's new and what's happening next? Well, one of the things I love about Soul Fire that constantly challenges my really linear three, five, ten year plan brain is we don't do anything that the community hasn't explicitly asked us to do. Call That's how response. we're accountable. Call and call, yes, call and response. And so most recently, the community has asked us for more Spanish language programming for the farm workers. So mm -hmm. we now have a whole eight workshop series over the summer that's interpreted plus a week-long immersion. We've been called to account for more work with indigenous communities. So we're working on a land trust that's about return and rematriation of lands to indigenous and black people. And most recently, folks have been saying, so when are you going to build that online university <laughs> all right then <laughs> so that'll be a couple years out because that's quite a big project but i think there's a a need to either even further decentralize take it out of text right and put it into video and online discussion forums and so be looking for that in the couple of years the farming well black you <laughs> um your passion you know uh, comes through. It just shines through. Um, I mean, I can, we can see your health alone, but just your passion for what you do. It, um, I would dare to say this is not a job. This is, uh, uh, this is your life. This is your this journey, is um, your purpose. And I am hoping that those who are listening to the live stream and is in podcast world that you are pretty amped up now because you want to plug into this energy <laughs> and into this passion. Um, this book again, uh, Farming Wide Black, it gives you a little bit of everything. If you're sitting at home and you think, you know, I want to know about herbs. Well, there's a little bit of that. I want to know about the business side. I, I'm, I was even pleased to see, I talked about the Cuban experience in the book, but I also, you mentioned uh, Caesar farm workers. Chavez. Chavez, yes. right? Dolores Herta is yep. one of my sheroes. So I, that was another thing that sort of maybe bubbled up like, yay, this is, this is happening. Um, and also too, the engagement of youth. Mm -hmm. So we're going to open up the lines or the streams, <laughs> or whatever this <laughs> thing is, uh, to, uh, to questions from our audience. Uh, we've got a live audience. I'm sure that these people are experts too who are in the audience and thinking, I want to ask that a really hard question. You know what <laughs> I mean? So we're opening it up to the lines and for those listening, this is Soil to Soul 360, happens every week, and we are with Leah Penniman, and we are with Farmin Wild Black, and you talked about Karen Washington, and you referenced her. Mm -hmm. The foreword is by Karen Washington, so again, someone who inspired yes. you. You've come full circle with that. It is always good to, to big up the publisher so I can keep my job, and it's <laughs> Chelsea Green Publishing, so this is good. And also want to say props to, to the African Food Basket and all those people too, mm -hmm. and to Food Share. I uh, want to say props to all of that for bringing you here to our great city of Toronto. Uh, so we are waiting uh, questions from the audience. One of the questions though that the young men did ask 
is how in the city can we have a bigger presence of urban farming? Uh, that was one of the questions that they wanted to know. How do we make it bigger and make it more public? So there you go. That's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. So I please forgive me because I'm less familiar with the laws in Canada, but in the United States, the government doesn't actually give support to urban farming the way it does to rural farming. So we're mm. lobbying to try to create something called the Urban Agriculture Act, would, which would allow us to have extension agents to support us. We would have access to some of the same grants to rural farmers, and that mm. would go a long way uh, because... Once a farmer is considered a farmer, right, then they can get resources to support. Hmm. Another big movement that we're working on is the land bank movement. So land bank is an entity uh, for us that the government creates to collect lands that have been foreclosed upon and then redistribute them in the community. And those can be sites for urban agriculture that have potential for secure land tenure. So mm -hmm. for me, it's always about what are those systemic resources? Because the will is there, but we need the land, we need the money, yes. we need the technical assistance. Yes. Right? Yeah, we need the freedom. Mm -hmm. My name is Bashir Mounia. As you can see, I'm dressed as a chef tonight. Pretty much every night I'm dressed as a chef. I'm a big fan supporter of the, uh, the African food basket. I'm uh, very privileged that I had uh, the opportunity to speak and listen to some of the guidance uh, of uh, Anand. Um, the biggest challenge that we find in here in Toronto is that many chefs of color, we don't really have access to food that is uh, culturally relevant to us. We are looking for okra. The difference between uh, the African-American experience and the multi-ethnic African communities of Toronto, we're trying to find food that is uh, closer to us. So myself as a Somali person, I'm looking for something from Somalia or very similar mm -hmm. to the East African community. Some, somebody from the Ghanaian community are looking for something different. Uh, do you feel that there is a lot of a demand uh, in your farm for food that is uh, culturally relevant uh, to yeah. a broader audience? I'm so appreciative that yes. you bring that up because I think that this is where I diverge from the local food movement a bit because I think our cultural foods are essential. And that does involve some degree of globalization and trade. Like, there is nothing like a platano. I'm sorry. There's nothing like moringa or a mango. And I'm not saying that we can't have the majority of our diet be local, and we can also extend the season. Like, we grow some beautiful okra, but we have to grow it on black plastic. You know, we grow some beautiful melons. We grow them in the high tunnel, etc. So we can stretch, and there certainly are substitutions. There are different greens that you can use that taste enough like kalalu. You know, that you're good. But there are some foods that are just our foods. So one thing that we are trying to do, and this is again probably a couple years out, is to establish our partnerships with our sister farms in Vieques, in Haiti, in Brazil, to try to get some of those products into our food baskets that we give out so you can have the things like from the homeland. Um, and I think that's crucial. So no, no shame in a little importation in my personal opinion, but some people are gonna be mad at me about that. <laughs> Can some of them be grown here, and what can you know? What efforts have been made to to ensure that these Somalian crops, in your case, uh, some of them could be grown here? Yeah, so now Ontario. I'm not really sure yeah. how much you know about Ontario, but Ontario, um, seventy percent of the what we call the here Ontario, the world crops uh, are currently grown in Ontario. Wow. So there is a part of the land is called the green the green belt which is a fer fertile soil and um, in uh, about a couple hundred kilometers south on Portover they grow peanuts so a lot of African community eat peanuts and now Portover is the largest farming community of peanuts in all over Canada uh, the African food basket grow kalalu but a lot of farmers in Ontario they grow kalalu but they cannot harvest it fast enough because they call it pigweed so they farm it and then they throw it to the pigs. Uh, they don't know that our community, it's part of our daily staples. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now there is another community here that are growing uh, ginger and turmeric. Obviously there is a difference between uh, growing food and having the financial accessibility to it. Mm. So it's difficult for myself as a chef to be part of the landscape when I cannot necessarily afford to be ab able to eat asparagus in season for $7 a pound. So a lot of it, uh, people of color cannot afford to be able to eat uh, local grown food. So that's why it's so important for the African food basket to be supported because they're bringing wholesome food at cost into the community. Yeah. 
Very cool. I have um, here, uh, we, we, we've got fans. Um, <laughs> people are saying beautiful things that everybody in the world should be looking at the video. Uh, question is, are you going to be giving a workshop soon in Connecticut? Um, you seem to have a lot of people from Connecticut who are following you right now. Um, that's big up, big up for Soil to Soul 360. Uh, somebody else wanted to say that they're just in awe of your dedication and again, that passion that is coming through. And uh, are you doing, when, when next are you doing <laughs> workshops? Uh, that's a big one. Everybody wants to follow you. Everyone wants to hang out. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. I want to hang out with all y'all. I mean, here's yes. the thing about passion. You know, our great, great, great grandmothers braided okra, millet, cowpea, black rice, and sorghum into their hair being, before they were forced to board transatlantic slave ships because they had hope. Mm -hmm. And they were facing some conditions that most of us cannot imagine. And they were putting seeds in their cornrows for us to inherit. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it would actually be a disrespect to that legacy and that foresight not to have hope and dedication and commitment for those to come. So if folks want to hang out, mm -hmm. our website has a lot of information, including all the places that we'll be and times you can come to the farm. So it's soulfirefarm.org. And you can go to the program calendar page and just check it all out. Um, every month we have community farm days. People are welcome to come visit the farm. We have still spaces in some of our one-day workshops. And so I imagine there's something on there for everybody, too. All right. And uh, about the person, too, who says, please tell Leah that she is incredibly inspirational mm -hmm. and she empowers me as a mixed-race Guyanese immigrant who is passionate about environmental oh, justice and appreciates intersectional approaches to land justice, especially when no one looks like me in this work. That's so, beautiful. Um, Thank you. Right? So there are other constituencies, too, who are... And what's something, too, that you would um, say to the people of T Toronto, you know, we always like to, to encourage people to keep on keeping on. And you've been out here like a day or a day and a half. Um, <laughs> I just got here a couple hours You just got hours here ago, like, yeah. got a couple of hours. So oh, like, yeah. this is like driving black, driving through. <laughs> you can add this to the title. Okay, bye. This is cool. Uh, this is your first time in Toronto? You know, I came when I was a young person. My dad had some work to do in Toronto, and I came up, and I remember thinking it was so fun in Canada because you all say pop and serve soda, and you say Chesterfield for sofa, and you say A. And I remember writing in my little the eight-year-old journal about all these Canadian <laughs> So I was here once, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> That's a pretty good memory and pretty good recall. Yeah. Um, uh, based on... One of the questions, too, that was asked about different types of food, I was listening to the car to a um, talk show, yeah. and uh, someone was making the case that you eat local. Wherever that food is grown, okay. that's what you eat. Anything that is transported and brought in, no, that's not good. You don't want to have bananas ripening on a boat and all these things. Um, and uh, so I'm, I, I was curious about your comment um before and what's your feeling about that that that's a pretty rigid thing but yeah so we have a cabinet in our house that we call the 80 20 cabinet because 80 percent of the time we're eating locally grown fresh picked you know one hour old green vegan all things right and 20 percent of the time we're opening a bag of chips <laughs> or whatever and eating out of that you know and and I think it's a very important concept because sometimes with purism we get really rigid mm. so there's like the study that just came out where they prescribe a diet for the whole planet for climate no come on now <laughs> come on now one diet for everybody I don't think so what about our cultures what about our traditions what about our geographies mm -hmm. what about communities where for most of the winter time all you can eat is the seafood and they, you're telling them to be vegan. You know, so I think the rigidity is where it's tricky. Of course, it's more sustainable if you can get food locally. Mm -hmm. But when you start having to heat it and grow it indoors under grow lights because it's winter, that mm -hmm. plane ride looks a little bit more attractive. And so I, I think that something that we sometimes lose mm -hmm. is nuance and critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I pray for our movement that we don't 
get afraid of ideas and that we can actually sit down and be like, well, let's debate local without feeling like you're not on my team anymore, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm going to throw you under the bus because mm -hmm. you have a different idea. Mm -hmm. Let's really engage. If I came to your house to dinner, what would be that best dish that you would serve? Well, if I made the time, which I would definitely do that for you, nice. I would make you soup jumu. Soup jumu is the Haitian freedom dish because when we were enslaved under the French, the jumu pumpkin, which was a gift to black people from the Taino native folks in exchange for our black eyed pea, was forbidden for us to eat. It's so delicious. It's mm. buttery, it's textured, it's dark, it's beautiful, sweet. But when we got our freedom in 1804 against defeating Napoleon, you're like the most powerful army in the world at the time with machetes and fire, the first thing we did was to cook up that pumpkin in a soup. And people go around now every new year and taste the soups of all their neighbors. They sip the different soups and we celebrate that on January 1st. Hmm. So that's what I would make for you. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. <laughs> See, you learned something. And you can make it locally with butternut or kabucha squash. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> more people scream in, please come to Seattle. Are your sister farms all over the states too? Um, yeah, anyone who wants to be my sister farm, you go right ahead. Okay. Uh, more people send in greetings, lots of love. Everybody send in love. I need uh, the love. Right? Any we other all questions the from the audience? You spoke about imports uh, on some things, and I think immediately of fair trade yeah. and how important that yeah. is as a component that, yes, we can't do it all locally, and I agree with you yeah. completely and wholeheartedly, uh, but there is an alternative yeah. in the long distance, and that's fair trade. Thank you for bringing that up. That is, to me, um, an obvious thing that I should have made explicit, that it doesn't mean that you buy <laughs> food from folks, you know, conditions for folks have been exploited. It's very important that that trade is ethical and equitable. So thank you for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the land trust that you were talking about in the land return. Sure. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. You. So. You know, a shout out to the Northeast Farmers of Color, the council, the co-coordinators. This is an organization that was birthed, was catalyzed from Soul Fire, but is much beyond. So there's about 150 black and brown farmers who are members of this organization. It's very new um, and we're working through incorporation and all that. But the idea with the land trust is it is land held in common, mm. not held privately. So we're forming this trust that is a collaboration between black and indigenous folks. And there's a lot of healing that needs to be done for that collaboration to work. Um, the history of that is beyond the scope of this conversation, but definitely read Indigenous Peoples History of the United yeah. States, mm -hmm. definitely read King Leopold's Ghost, like understand the traumas. So all that to say folks are coming together and there are good hearted people who realize that the land they're on is not theirs and are ready to give it away mm. and just need a mechanism, right? for how they can do that in an accountable way. So that's what we're providing is this mechanism. And we're looking forward to redistributing hundreds, if not thousands of acres across the New England states and New York to indigenous community first, and then also to black, Latinx, and Asian communities, farmers, um, to use in a sustainable way that honors our ancestors' dreams. Hmm. So. Oh, yeah. yeah, very fantastic. Uh, people try to ask you, what are you doing with more stuff? <laughs> uh, you know, lots, lots, <laughs> lots of shout outs. You're, you're, you're you do, you get, you get big fans. Uh, your sister's fam, so happy to see Leah in Toronto. So many powerful women in the growing space. Uh, yeah. I love you back. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to look at the feed later and say hi, hi back to my friends. Yeah, this is, is. I just feel happy that y'all are still awake with me because if it wasn't for you, I would definitely be fast asleep <laughs> cuddling with my stuffed buffalo. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> when a Nan said, you know what, we, we got all uh, excited. You're coming at 930 and then there was this whole conversation like, you a farmer? Like 930, you know, you, you go to sleep with people who like make bread. And, and you know, no matter how hard rolling. I try, I cannot sleep in because it's so ingrained in me to get up at sunrise. The most I've slept in in my adult life is like 7.30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a big accomplishment. So wow, I tend to wow. go to bed pretty What's early. What's that like in the morning? I love the mornings. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's precious. 
first of all, no one's up to bother you and ask you for anything. So that's one beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But the magic, that is when the animals are out. So what I do at dawn is I go on a run. And I have seen owls, porcupines. I have seen, of course, deer, foxes, and coyotes, because that's when they're out. And they're not afraid. So those encounters to me is what keeps magic and mystery in my life. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, I believe that we are coming to the end of this segment. Uh, Leah, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, just, just, just the spirit of you um, and all that you do. Um, I hope that people take advantage of not only reading the book, but uh, following the work of Soul Fire, the organization, um, and also too that they're inspired um, to get more involved into with farming, with planting. Um, we had a sister some weeks ago who came for an interview and she came from an activist background into farming. And what I recalled her saying was the first day she, again, like you mm. said, she put her hands in the ground and, and this was such a beautiful moment. But she said, when I harvested and I gave the food as a present to someone, the joy that came on their face. And elders say food is something that should be shared. You never keep it, you never hoard it. Mm. Um, it, is, it is one of those things. And, and any time that people get together, especially people of African descent get together, we are always, we always bless the table. We remember all those people who farmed and who toiled and whatever because we are conscious that it is something. It is that thing, like air, it has to be shared. But I also, too, want to close on this moment also. I like that we closed on the beauty of the first of early morning. <laughs> uh, some people think about exercising and jogging and having that, that quiet time. And you're talking about your relationship um, with the animal world and with nature. But I'm going to go back to the introduction of your book. Um, and it says, revolution mm. is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. Brother Malcolm X, Ashe. the first quote in the introduction to Farm and Why Black, Soul Fire Farms Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land by Sister Leah Penniman, forward by Karen Washington. Plenty love from Toronto, enough Thank respect, you. keep on keeping on, and good things just follow you always. Ashe, and thank you. The earth loves you back. I am the evidence of love under fingernails. Kneecaps stained from kneeling to pray, sacred remains of yesterday, fertile with the future. I am musk after rain, soft, firm, unconditional embrace, bosom of returning. I am the earth and floor, slap with souls of feet, origin story and sorcery. I am vast in cosmic compost, sand, silt, stone, composition of decomposed bones and primordial ferns, reborn. I am sun, turned to rot, Particles of stardust heaped in terracotta pots, this thing the living clings to. Nascent, seething, ancient tree, this melanin-rich thickness dripping 